Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. We're going to be singing out of the uh, celebrational hymnal. So if you'll go ahead and get that hymnal out this morning. And let's turn to hymn number 740, 740. Let's all stand. Ask Jacob if he don't. Time when we'll turn it over to Brother Wayne. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Old Bethel this morning, whether you are here with us or join us at a, another time through some medium. It's good to be together. It's good to be in the Lord's house. If you don't have a church home, a church family, I could recommend this church and this family to you. We'd love to have you with us here at 930 on Sunday mornings. It's the Lord's Day. It's uh, the day that we worship. It's not the Sabbath. It's the Lord's Day. We worship on the Lord's Day because everything has changed. Has your life changed? If not, come and be with us. Allow the Holy Spirit to move upon you and change your life. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Wayne. We're going to get back into our song service this morning. Our next hymn is hymn number 503, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart, 503. Thank you. 
Our next hymn is 762. What a day that will be. 762. Well, it's time for our children's message, and Shelly, we got some little fellow down here is awful excited about the children's message. He's already down here this morning, so we'll turn it over to Shelly at this time for our children's message. Well, good morning, Parker. Glad you're here. Do you like to sing? No? Well, I do. I sing when I'm happy. I sing when I'm sad. I sing at church, I sing at school a lot. My kids probably are sick of hearing me sing at school. Some people love to sing. They sing in their cars, in the shower, at church, in lots of places. The story of Paul and Silas teaches us that even when we're scared, we can sing and praise God. Paul and Silas were telling people about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. The rulers of the day didn't want others to hear about Jesus, so they had Paul and Silas beaten, thrown in prison, and chained so they couldn't escape. That seems pretty bad to me, but no matter how bad their situation, Paul and Silas knew that God loved them, and whatever happened, God would be with them. Even when their lives looked sad, they still remembered that God loved them, and that made them extremely happy. So they sang. Now, if I was in prison and chained up and they'd beat me up, I'm not real sure I'd feel like singing, but that would be the right thing to do because God loves us no matter what situation we're in. <clears throat> Have you ever been scared? Mm 
Mm-hmm. When you're scared, you need to be like Paul and Silas. Remember that God loves you and he's with you and sing a song. Let's sing a song now. Okay? Well, I'm going to sing, and anybody else that wants to join can you? You're going to take a lesson from your mama. She loves to sing. She sang on the way home from Tupelo yesterday. And other people that were in jail with Paul and Silas heard them praying and singing. All of a sudden, there was a big earthquake. The jail doors flew open and all the prisoners' chains came loose. The guards thought the prisoners would escape and that they'd get in big trouble. He was going to kill himself, but Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The guard had heard Paul and Silas praising God and wanted to know how to be saved. Paul and Silas told him about Jesus. The guard took the prisoners to his home washed their wounds, fed them a meal, and he and his whole family were baptized. Now that's just a miracle right there. What if that happened at the prison here? Do you think those prisoners would stay there? They'd run off, wouldn't they? Probably. All right, let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the example of Paul and Silas, and help us to be mindful that when we're scared or worried, that we can sing a song of praise to you and that you're always there and you always love us. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time for our ushers will come we'll receive this morning's offering.
interesting. Now, last week, this was actually on the bulletin, and I actually didn't see it. And I know Patsy was really upset because we didn't get to sing this song because she loves it. But we're going to sing it today because Pam was nice to us to put it back on there again. It's called This is Holy Ground. It's hymn number 217 in your celebrational hymn. Let's get that hymnal out and sing uh, This is Holy Ground. This time we're going to turn it over to Brother Wayne for this morning's message. Just being with you last week, I would much rather have been here, believe me. Uh, I mean, I like being around my children, but I don't care much about being around several other hundred people that i never seen before, but uh, I guess that's part of it. know if that would have went over very well but anyway it uh it is good to be back with you um we're going to look at the fourth chapter of Luke's gospel we're going to begin reading at verse 20 and read through verse 30 can you imagine I mean really just stop and think if you had been there with Paul and Silas and these things were happening. Not if you were Paul and Silas, but you're just there. You're, you're there and you're seeing it happen. You're experiencing what the others experienced. Um, as miraculous as that might seem to us, would it make any difference? And you know it would. You're sitting there, you're in jail, maybe been there three months, six months, might have just got locked up that night. They might have brought you in with Paul and Silas. And this earthquake, this earth shaking happens and all the cell doors fly open. It would change your life. We come to church every Sunday. How many millions or billions never think about God, never have any expression, perhaps never have heard of Him? Does that change our life? 
Does it make any difference that we come and go from this place every week? I thought as Jacob was praying this morning, how many times have I said almost the same prayer? You know, Lord, do something to make this country again be what it set out to be, what it used to be, what we just took for granted for so long that we lost it. That's a great prayer. It's a prayer we all should pray. What do we do about it? What do we do about it? It's so easy to pray a prayer and then go on about your business. Um, We have a part to play. I tried to explain this to a fellow once and I said, I believe in prayer. No doubt in my mind. But I said, I promise you, if you go out on 78 Highway and lay down in that right-hand lane, crossways of the lane, and lay there, I don't care how much you pray, the first vehicle that comes along is probably going to run over you. And you can't blame that on God or on prayer. You can only blame you. So we come to these places, we being believers, Where the body of Christ gathers regularly. And we pray prayers for change. And then we leave these places. And I'm afraid that we leave the responsibility for that change in those places. But that responsibility is ours. There was a time when we didn't know God. There was a time when we might have known about God. And you may still be in that phase where you sort of know about God, but you don't don't really know God. We have so cheapened grace in Christianity that I think most people don't really know God. They know about God, but they don't really know God. And so not anything changes. It's very difficult, if not flat out impossible, to discern a Christian from a non-believer in public. In this day and time, also in private. We're going to read some scripture, and we're going to miss, in in the lectionary reading for today, we're going to miss what was last week. The previous reading, Jesus is preaching to his hometown. And he's preaching the deliverance, restoration, release. I'm going to begin reading this morning at Verse 20 of chapter 4, the gospel according to Luke. I'm going to read from a new international version of the Bible. As you are able, would you please stand for the reading of the gospel. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. I tell you the truth, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And 
There were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. My friends, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. He's just preached this tremendous sermon. He's read from the scriptures about restoration of sight, release of the captive, good news to the poor. And they can't get over themselves with how amazed, how proud they are of the hometown boy. Then he begins to remind them of the truth. And the truth shows itself. We're not worried about anybody else. We're especially not concerned in the way you might think with our enemies. We're concerned with us. What's in it for us? There are two ways, I believe, to hear this scripture. One way to hear it and, and, and to receive it is about who we are. And that's perhaps the most difficult, or it is the most difficult to preach and to hear, and we might think it, it's the most beneficial. That at the very core of us, we're selfish, it's easy to take this scripture and say, you know, we, we need to throw down every, every gate, every barrier, this whole talk of building walls. We need to take in all of the refugees, not some of them. And if we don't, we're not a good Christian. And believe me, it gets used like that all the time. They take God's word and manipulate God's people. But I believe the more beneficial for us, we know we're bad. We know we're bad. We know we come and leave this place like we have so many other times. And we know what we've done and what we haven't done, what we've said, what we haven't said. We know. Um, you know why we don't have confession in the United Methodist Church any longer? We used to. Used to, in Wesley's day, you couldn't receive Holy Communion unless you first came and had confession. You had to show some remorse, some repentance. You sort of had to qualify to receive God's great gift of His Son. We didn't like that. That's uncomfortable. So we don't have it anymore. We used to have a mourner's bench. If you didn't act right, if you fell out of fellowship, if you were unfaithful to your vows, I've told, I think all of you, I've, I know I've told Pam, I really like that you have the vows on this bulletin. I hope you read them every Sunday. But if you were less than faithful in that, then you fell out of fellowship and you'd have to we didn't kick you out of the church, but you'd have to sit on the mourner's bench until you redeemed yourself. Oh, you don't have that anymore. That might put somebody off. We're so afraid of offending everyone except the one. We don't sing. I'd already asked him, Miss Shelley, to, why he wasn't in the choir. And I got kind of the same reaction. I can remember being that age. Oh, my goodness. Miss Anna Lois would come around, and she played the piano and sort of led the choir from the piano. And you weren't asked to come and sit in the choir. You were ordered. And You know, we had them mean parents that went along with all of that. And so, anyway, 
But we sing everywhere else. We sing in the shower. We sing out in the woods. We sing wherever we want to. Go to a ball game. Boy, people will lift their voices. They don't care who hears. But we come to church and not so much. Not so much. We know who we are. I don't have to tell you who you are. I believe, though, the more beneficial and what we need to hear is and what this scripture is speaking about, this passage, the benefit it has for us today because if it's not valid for you today here at Old Bethel, why are we going through this exercise? But I believe the truth is that we need to hear is it's about who God is. It's about who God is. I have the awfulest time trying to find hymns because I, I can't remember the names of them and they, they play tricks on you. The name may not necessarily be what you think it is. But anyway, I've turned to one that uh, I want to sing a verse for you. Um, and I want you to listen to it because it tells the truth. I heard a preacher preaching all the way over this morning about John 3.16. And that's great. If you asked uh, Christians, uh, self-professing believers, what they believe about God on the spot, that's what they'll quote you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, we don't use old English in anything else, but now, boy, they're going to roll that out. I have become very fond of John 3, 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but he sent him that the world might have life through him. So who is God? What's he about? What's his scripture about? Yeah, God's going to do wonderful things. He's going to restore sight to the blind. He's going to release the captive. He's going to set them free. Luke's gospel, like we were taught in school, is all about the reversal. Putting the least first. Those on the bottom, on the top. I love this song because it captures, I believe, God's message to us. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home. Come home, you who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. How many of you? have children or have had children or helped raise somebody else's? How many of you wish you could see them more? They're us. They're a part of us. They're God's gift to us. They need to be with us. I had an uncle who lived to be way over 100, and he was pretty funny in his last years. He was always pretty funny. But uh, Uncle Clarence, Uncle Clarence's children did real well, built nice homes all over the place, different places. But he used to say quite regularly, and more so as he got older, is, that was just ridiculous that his, every one of his children ought to have a house right there behind his. They ought to be right there on the place. And the older I get, the more I understand that. 
I think about, though, how much more so God, who understands true life and understands the insignificance of all of our trials and tribulations in the greater scheme of what He's doing. He wants us to come home. He wants all of his children to come home. Not those that behaved the best in light of those that didn't, but all of them. Jesus is trying to get us to understand because we are going to be his hands, his eyes, his voice to all of those children. the Syrians, the Gentiles, the hated, the least, the last, the lost, the despised, the troubled. Hey, Daddy wants you to come home. Not, well, you've been really, really bad, and if you straighten up and this and that and the other, I'll talk to him for you. No, Daddy sent me with a message for you. He wants you to come home. We live in a complicated world, and we complicated it. We came up with ways to kill and harm and abuse and destroy that never were before. We did that. And it's complicated now. But God's message is not. He didn't send you to fix our relationship between our country and Syria. He sends you out that door right there to fix every relationship that you encounter on your way. God's kingdom comes heart by heart. That's his design. He ordained it that way. He sends you out to impart the love that he's given to you to everyone you meet. You don't get to qualify, nor do you get to disqualify. I've always been amazed by the things that the church disapproves of and then washes their hands. And yet they come and say, God can fix it all. God can straighten out anything. With the Lord, all things are possible. But we're not going to have anything to do with that. Thank God. He didn't act that way with us. As the Father sent me, our Lord, our Savior, who died for us, said, so I send you. They were so offended that they tried to kill Jesus. Why? When you hold a mirror up, Sometimes people don't like what they see. They've got to destroy it. Okay, gentlemen, I need y'all to back me up. I think I can get to the door, get in my truck. I'm pretty fast for a fat boy. Have you ever seen a woman look in a mirror and say, Ooh, I look good this morning. People don't like what they see. And he had to go. What he was trying to tell them was it doesn't matter what you see in the mirror. It doesn't matter what you see out there. God wants us all to come home. And he's made a way and I am the way and you've seen it fulfilled in your presence. Now, 
I am here to tell you whether you've ever realized it, thought about it, understood it, accepted it. You have seen it fulfilled in your presence in this church. Did you hear what Jack was praying about before we received the offering? That's the fulfillment of God's promise to redeem. You've already seen it. Your presence here is testimony and witness and a miracle. You don't get a stamp. We don't, you know, it's not like going to the club and you get you a stamp and you can go to work next morning. Yeah, I was at the club last night. You don't get a ticket. You don't get something to put in your wallet or your purse. It's called faith. Faith. Something you can't see, you can't touch. You just have to trust in. So you came trusting in something you can't see, you can't touch. The world says you are an idiot. God says you are mine. That's a miracle that you would do that. So if you've never thought about seeing a miracle, you've seen it. You've seen God's prophecy fulfilled in your presence here and now. So what's going to happen when you leave this place? What's going to happen when you encounter the least and the last and the lost? Church people, people that know about God's grace and have received that grace for themselves... They don't really need you. They might need a little encouragement every once in a while. But these people that we have discounted and written off, they're the ones that need you. They need you. Now I know, it's like I said, we've complicated things. We've come up with so many ways to hurt and harm and kill people that it's literally dangerous. Who are you trusting in? You or God? You or God? I get into these discussions all the time with people I know that I care deeply for and they're, you know, they're big gun carriers and this, that, and the other, and that's, that's wonderful and great. But my father, I've heard him tell several people before. And it's the reason I don't, I don't ever carry a gun with me anywhere unless I'm going to shoot something. And that's going to be a snake or something like that. I don't hunt. I, my father said, unless you're willing to kill somebody, then that weapon's going to be taken away and, from you and used on you. I couldn't kill anybody. Couldn't do that. That's pretty simple to me. It's easy. I, but you see, this thing about having saving knowledge that you receive by faith, you can't see it. You see a gun. They're heavy. They're, 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 they're powerful. You have a mental image and a, there's something physical there. You, it's easy to know and it's easier to make a decision about. And, and I'm not preaching about, you know, should you, shouldn't you. That's not what I'm talking about. But this thing of faith, this saving knowledge that God has placed in your heart, you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it, it has no weight. It's easier to dismiss. It's really simple to make that decision, I'm not going to carry a weapon and kill anybody or even shoot at anybody. That, Weapons heavy, you gotta do something with it, you gotta have a permit or something, you gotta there's so many things. But we walk around with this impartation of grace, of life in us that we never even think about. We don't ever make that decision consciously to withhold it. We just walk on by. We keep to ourselves. We don't say anything. We don't interject. But it's the same thing. You're killing them. 
you're killing them. Well, they were okay with killing the Syrians and the Gentiles. They're not one of us. There are no Syrians and Gentiles with God. They're just children. And he wants them to come home. And he sent you to tell them that. That he's made a way, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, that they can come home. When we withhold that, we haven't set them free, we haven't restored their sight. We've condemned them to death. I'm not saying that somebody else might come along and do those things. But one day, my friends, we will stand before God Almighty. And I fully believe that he's not going to ask us anything but one. I believe it's going to go something like this. Wayne, I'm glad to see you. I did everything so that you could be here. What did you do for my children? You see, he's done everything for us. You might say, well, oh no, Aunt Mary or Uncle Paul or this, that, and the other. But he's the one that sent them. He gave them that life and that call on their life, and they gave it to you. It's straight from Jesus. When he asks you, what did you do for my children? What are you going to be able to tell him? It's going to be a hard place to be. And I don't want to be there. And I don't want you to be there. I want you to be able to faithfully, truthfully say everything I could, every time I could, as much as I could, as long as I could. That's what Wesley called us. And people thought he was, oh, he's a genius. No, no. He's just a good Christian because that's what Jesus called us to do. No less than him. It cost him everything. What happened after it cost him everything? He gained everything. We go on about our lives and we can't find fulfillment. We can't find purpose. Your purpose is to impart life everywhere to everyone all the time. Is that your reality? It would be so easy to be standing in that cell encountering that earthquake and that shaking and rattling and see all of those cells fly open and go out and tell people about it. How easy is that a story to start a conversation about the miraculous work of God. But you, my friend, are here because God first came to you. And it's just as easy. You know, but for Christ, who knows where we would be, if we would even be. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day, for this church, for those that gather here. I pray that if there are any lacking in the saving grace and knowledge of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, that the Holy Spirit would move upon them and open their hearts to receive it. That if any have doubted and fallen short, that you would encourage them, that Spirit would inspire them to move ahead. Father, if there are any here who need to make a decision, I pray that they would choose you your way, your life. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So we turn to our closing hymn this morning, 657. If you'd like to come and pray, I encourage you to do that. If you'd like someone to pray with you, if you'll lift a hand, some of us will. Otherwise, we're not going to bother you. Um, If you need to make a decision, please don't think that you can put that off. No, you just don't choose God. You will make a decision. Please come as we sing 657.
peace, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you always. Amen.